light is invisible, and invisibility is one of its most understandable properties. We see it only then when it strikes the retina of our eye. And yes, we cannot see light that just passes right by without reflecting off anything. Imagine an empty, dust-free, absolutely sterile room, never ending in all directions, so that before concluding the experiment, light does not have time to reach the walls and return, or rather the walls of the room should be matte black to completely absorb the light. Now, just imagine you are observing a flashlight from the side that is turned on. Wonderful. No, it's not exactly like that. You won't see the flashlight, neither the flashlight itself, nor the light that it emits. It's counterintuitive, but light is invisible. We cannot see it from the side when it's not reflecting off anything. If there were a reflective object in the beam of light, or even dust or water droplets to diffuse the light, we would be able to see it. But since there is nothing in the way of the light beam, and we are looking at it from the side, its light does not reach us. If there was a second light source in the room, then we would be able to see the flashlight, but not the light it emits. Beams of light, no matter how intense they are, even those that we can develop with a laser, just pass through each other as if there was nothing at all in their path. These insights are contained in the book The Structure of Reality by the British physicist and philosopher David Deutsch, one of the creators of the concept of quantum computing. The book as a whole graphically demonstrates that the era of great philosophical systems is by no means a thing of the past. The author sets forth a comprehensive answer consistent with scientific knowledge to one of the most fundamental philosophical questions what is the true nature of reality? And today, we will try to make sense of it. To an observer who is in the beam of light and moving away backwards from the flashlight, the flashlight's reflector would appear even smaller and when it would be visible only as a point, even fainter. The question then arises, can light really travel indefinitely in ever thinner beams? No. At a distance of about 10,000 kilometers from the flashlight, its light would be too weak for the human eye to distinguish. The observer would not see anything. In other words, a person would not see anything, but an animal with more sensitive vision would. Take for example a frog, whose eyes are several times more sensitive than human eyes. This is quite enough to perceive a noticeable difference when conducting the experiment. If the observer was a physicist frog and it was moving away from the electric flashlight, the moment it completely loses sight of it would never come. Instead, the frog would see the flashlight begin to twinkle. The twinkles would occur at irregular intervals, which would increase as the frog moved away from the flashlight. But the individual flashes would not become less bright. At a distance of 100 million kilometers from the flashlight, the frog would see on average only one flash of light per day, but this flash would be no less bright than any other observed from any other distance. Unfortunately, we don't know the language of frogs, which means that we won't be having scientific discussions with them. Therefore, when conducting genuine experiments, researchers use photomultipliers. These are light detectors, the sensitivity of which exceeds the sensitivity of a frog's eye and which reduces the light by passing it through dark filters. After all, observing light at a distance of 100 million kilometers from its source is slightly problematic. However, neither the principle nor the result changes from this, nor the illusory darkness, nor the unwavering faintness, but the twinkle, the flashes are of equal brightness, no matter how dark a filter we use. This twinkle proves that there is a limit to the uniform propagation of light, each flash is caused by a photon hitting the retina. A beam of light becomes weaker, not because the photons themselves become weaker, but because they drift apart from each other and the empty space between them expands. And this means the light becomes too weak to have an effect on the retina. 
This property of light to appear merely in the form of particles of discrete sizes is called quantization, and the individual particle of light, the photon, is called quantum of light. The quantum theory, as it so happens, got its name precisely because this property is attributed to all measurable physical quantities. Yes, everything that surrounds us and seems solid, in fact, is not. There is a world of diverse phenomena in quantum physics and quantization is one of the most elementary. But let's get back to our photons. You of course have heard about Thomas Young's double slit experiment more than once. This experiment belongs to the general class of double path experiments in which an initial wave is split into two separate waves that later again combine into a single wave. Changes in the path lengths of both waves result in a phase shift creating an interference pattern. Young's experiment is a classic illustration of the fallacy of theories that consider light solely as a stream of particles. If photons would display the properties of particles exclusively, then there would be two brightly lit areas on the screen behind the slits and a dark area between them. Thanks to Young's experiment, physicists were obligated to take the wave properties of light into account. This means that each real photon has to be accompanied by at least a trillion shadow photons. You've probably heard statements like these. The pilot is experiencing a force of 7 Gs or gravitational forces. Or the acceleration force was 9 Gs or perhaps even more. Indeed, you yourself regularly experience stressful forces in everyday life. Well, that is not only emotional, but also physical. How do G-forces affect a person on Earth? How are they felt in space and even at faster than light speeds? Let's try to answer these questions. To begin with, as always, you should understand what G-forces are and how they occur. From the definition, it follows that a g-force is the ratio of the absolute value of linear acceleration caused by non-gravitational forces to the standard acceleration of free fall at the surface of the Earth. Being the ratio of two accelerations, g-force is a dimensionless value, but is often stated in units of the standard acceleration of free fall, g or gravity, which is 9.8 tenth of a meter per second squared. This represents how many times greater the force of inertia is in relation to the usual force of gravity acting upon a body under conditions of the Earth at sea level. And the more abrupt the maneuver, the stronger the g-force. The fact is, the human body is able to tolerate accelerations of higher than 9 g's for brief durations, but very few are capable of enduring them for more protracted periods of time. If it's only for brief moments, we humans can handle much higher g-forces without suffering serious injury. The record for enduring momentarily high g-forces belongs to Eli Beating, who rode backwards on a special rocket-powered sled in 1958 and literally took a force of 82.6 g's in the chest when the sled accelerated to 55 km per hour in one-tenth of a second. Beating lost consciousness, but got away with only small bruises on his back, demonstrating the incredible capabilities of the body. John Ivanovich Gridunov, an equipment tester for the Soviet space program, was also involved in numerous experiments that verified the limits of the human body. They even called him the ground-based astronaut. While testing a pressure suit, he underwent a number of experiments in a high-altitude pressure chamber, including uncontrolled decompression. During a simulated emergency landing, he experienced an impact force of 50 Gs, as well as having withstood a force of 19 Gs in the region of thoracic spine on a centrifuge. Even the Orion spacecraft won't be able to deliver our full velocity potential. But let's glance into the distant future when spaceships will be able to travel extremely fast, thousands of times faster than with today's technology. Let's remember that light travels at a speed of 300,000 kilometers per second. Consequently, 
if we assume that we will be able to overcome known technological limitations and build hyperspeed spacecraft, our delicate bodies, made mostly of water, will have to contend with the new risks that will result from such high-speed travel. If humans do acquire the ability to travel faster than light, the potential dangers that may be encountered are the discovery of a mind-boggling paradigm or the detection of wormholes in the current physical state. Even if we begin speeding up to 40,000 km per hour, the acceleration should be gradual. After all, it is specifically acceleration that affects the magnitude of the g-force. Hypothetically, you can speed a ship with a person aboard up to the speed of light. Let's just try to ignore the laws of physics here and make believe. But the question is not with the terminal velocity or final speed, but in how quickly it gathers that speed. If in a year our passenger remains safe at a speed of 1 km per second, even with a moderate increase in acceleration, that person won't have enough of his average life expectancy left to do it. If by chance he did achieve such a speed, contrary to all the laws of physics, he should feel no worse than he would being in an airplane. Having said that, if the acceleration from zero to speed of light took just a second, well, that'd be better not to imagine. Rapid acceleration and deceleration can be fatal for a human. Bodily injuries during road accidents occur during the process of the sudden drop in speed from tens of kilometers per hour to zero in a fraction of a second. It's all about the property of the universe known as inertia, as a result of which an object with mass resists change to its state of motion. Newton's first law of motion states that an object at rest remains at rest, and an object in motion remains in motion at the same speed and in the same direction until external forces have an effect upon it. The Andromeda Nebula has been known to man since ancient times. The first to notice it were the Chaldean priests, astronomers of the ancient world. At some point in the past, the Andromeda galaxy was the spitting image of our home, the Milky Way. But with the development of astronomy, this myth was dispelled. It turned out that the Milky Way and Andromeda belonged to different subclasses of spiral galaxies, and the configuration of their arms is quite different. But nonetheless, they still have a lot in common. For example, an appetite for devouring their dwarf satellite galaxies. Their internal structure is also similar. The Andromeda Galaxy, also known as M31, looks like a spiral, the lines of the arms of which being evenly dispersed around the spherical bulge, the central, bright part of the galaxy, which consists mainly of old, bright stars moving in extensive, elongated orbits. The Milky Way today, on the other hand, is assumed to be a galaxy of the SBBC classification, a barred spiral galaxy. The difference between our galaxy and M31 lies precisely in the bar. This is the portion that extends from the edges of the bulge and connects it to the arms. The nucleus of the Andromeda galaxy, like the nuclei of many other galaxies in the universe, has candidates located in them that have the potential to become supermassive black holes. Based on the results of calculations, the size of such an object could exceed that of up to 140 million times the mass of our Sun. In addition, the Hubble telescope discovered a mysterious disk which contained young blue stars surrounding supermassive black holes. They revolve around a relativistic object in exactly the same way planetary bodies do around their stars. Astronomers are a bit puzzled by how this kind of a disk could form so close to such a huge object. According to calculations, the enormous tidal forces of supermassive black holes should limit the gas and dust clouds from coalescing and forming new stars. Well, 
Further observations will likely provide us with clues to this mystery. According to rough estimates, the Milky Way may contain between 100 and 400 billion stars. But this is nothing compared to Andromeda, which may contain about a trillion. Thanks to the Hubble Space Telescope, among this trillion, scientists have learned about the presence of a very large and sparse population of hot and bright stars. Hot young stars tend to appear blue. However, the blue stars found in the Andromeda galaxy appear to be growing old, more like the Sun. Stars that have burned out their inner layers and are revealing their hot blue cores. They are scattered all across the center of the galaxy and are the brightest in the ultraviolet range. Besides that, there are other interesting objects located in the core of M31. Along these lines, a double or a binary cluster of stars was discovered in the center of Andromeda galaxy. This discovery turned out to be highly prized by the astronomical community since the merging of the two clusters into one could happen over a fairly short period of time, roughly in about a hundred thousand years. Based on calculations, astronomers have determined that the merging should have happened millions of years ago. However, due to some strange and still inexplicable reasons, it did not happen. According to one hypothesis, there may not be a double cluster at all in the middle of M31, but rather something like a ring consisting of old red stars. The ring might look like two clusters, because when observing, we only see the stars from the opposite side. The ring of the disk is turned to our galaxy on one side, from which it can be concluded that there is a certain interrelation between them. When studying the center of the Andromeda galaxy using the XMM-Newton telescope, a group of astronomers also discovered 63 discrete sources with X-ray emissions. Most of them, that being 46 objects, have been identified as binary X-ray stars, whereas other objects are acting as neutron stars or candidates for black holes from binary systems. About 460 globular clusters have also been registered in the galaxy. The most massive of them, Mayal 2 or G1, has a luminosity greater than that of any cluster in the local group. It is even brighter than the brightest cluster in the Milky Way, Omega Centauri. It is located at a distance of about 130,000 light years from the center of M31 galaxy and mainly consists of about 300,000 old stars. Similarly, the PA99N2 star is located in Andromeda, around which orbits the exoplanet, which is the first to be discovered outside the Milky Way. But as it stands today, the planet is still considered to be unconfirmed. However, in view of the scale of the Andromeda system, the presence of so many stars in it, and an even larger number of planets, it is quite possible at least according to the logic of the theory of probability, that among this abundance of planets, there are planets that are quite suitable for life, or already have life on them. After hundreds of thousands of years, we will be able to see everything much better, given the fact that a collision of the Andromeda galaxy and the Milky Way is inevitable. Mind you, this will happen in about 4 billion years. We'll be substantially older. With the help of the Hubble Space Telescope, researchers mapped out the huge shell of gas that surrounds the Andromeda galaxy and they were astonished to find that this thin, almost invisible halo of diffused plasma extends 1.3 million light-years out from the galaxy, about halfway to our Milky Way, and for 2 million light-years in other directions. This means that Andromeda's halo is already coming into contact with the halo of our galaxy. They also discovered that the halo has a layered structure, with two main layers and separate shells of gas. 
Understanding the huge gas halos surrounding galaxies is of crucial importance. This reservoir of gas contains the material for future star formation in a galaxy, as well as the remnants from events such as supernovas. It is filled with clues to the past and future evolution of the galaxy. It became clear that the inner shell, which stretches out about half a million light years, is much more complex and dynamic, while the outer shell is smoother and hotter. This difference is likely the result of the activity of supernovas in the galaxy's disk having a more direct effect on the inner halo. However, since we live within the Milky Way, it is not easy to deduce the profile shape of the halo of our own galaxy. It is presumed that the halo of Andromeda in the Milky Way must be very similar, since these two galaxies are also incredibly alike, both in relative size and in appearance. As modeling of the movement of the galaxies has indicated, they are both on the path to collision and will emerge forming a giant elliptical galaxy in about 5 billion years. But their weak halos have indeed already begun to come into contact with each other. Thus, we can say that the merger, although almost insignificant, has already begun. And there is no force that can stop this merging. But the question then becomes, what will happen to the galaxies if they are viewed from the side? In a collision, large galaxies absorb smaller ones entirely and it practically does not affect their structure. However, when galaxies are close in size like the Milky Way and the Andromeda, the collision causes their structure to collapse. A number of stars will be ejected from the galaxies, others will be swallowed up by the merging of supermassive black holes. At the same time, the beautiful spiral structure of both galaxies will be disrupted and a new, giant, elliptical galaxy will form in their place. These kinds of mergers could bring about a small upsurge in the formation of stars. The collision of galaxies forms vast hydrogen clouds, which can trigger a series of gravitational collapses. In addition to that, such mergers can be responsible for the premature aging of galaxies, as most of the gas turns into stars. After a burst of star formation, the galaxies run out of fuel. The youngest and hottest stars explode as supernovae, and all the remains are the old, cold, red stars which live for a very long time. This is why giant elliptical galaxies, the result of collisions, contain so many red stars and so few active star-forming regions. By the way, the merging of black holes will cause orbital energy to be transferred to the stars, which will subsequently move the stars to higher orbits over millions of years. When two black holes come within a light year of each other, they will start emitting gravitational waves. The gas caught up by the combined black hole could create a glowing quasar or active nucleus at the center of the reformed galaxy. And finally, an effect of the merger of black holes can be to give a good cosmic kick to some stars, which will become genuine castaways, taking their planets with them. Who knows, maybe the universe will cast us off. Well, the collision of galaxies is an event of truly grandiose proportions. These kinds of cataclysms will happen to any of them as soon as they inadvertently graze each other. In some cases, the galaxies merely brush each other in passing. In others, direct impacts follow, like a head-on collision of cars, decisively changing the appearance of both objects forever. How will our galaxy look like in billions of years? Time will tell, but it will be a completely different, unrecognizable world. Our universe is immense, and in it there are a considerable number of massive objects. There are giant planets, stars, 
in comparison with which our Sun is just a grain of sand, galaxies, clusters and superclusters of galaxies, walls and voids. This succession can continue, increasing in size and mass, and at any given point of this progression, you can find its accepted record holder, up to this point anyway. In this video, we will introduce you to the largest galaxies in the observable universe. So, fifth place in our galactic parade is taken by 3C348 of Hercules A, a yellowish galaxy with a diameter of 1.5 million light years at a distance of about 2 billion light years. Hercules A is one of the brightest extragalactic radio sources. The galaxy is about 1000 times more massive than the Milky Way, and Hercules A contains a black hole that is also 1000 times more massive than the black hole at the center of our galaxy. Unless you are a professional astronomer, you are unlikely to notice anything unusual in the photographs of the galaxies of Hercules A taken with the optical imaging. Even in the best of the shots, you will see an outwardly ordinary elliptical star system, of which thousands can be found in the vastness of space. But take your time. Observations have shown that Hercules A is very far from the Earth. In addition to that, with the development of radio astronomy, further observations have shown that by radio waves the galaxy looks completely different than it does in optical images. The radio waves do not emanate from the galaxy itself, but from two powerful jets shooting out from its center. In optical imaging they are completely invisible, but then by radio waves they show a complex structure. The next galaxy is IC1101, which for a long time was considered the largest in the observable universe, is rightfully in fourth place and resides in the massive cluster of galaxies Abel 2029 that is located on the very edge of the constellation of Virgo at a distance of 1.04 billion light years from the Earth. The galaxy has a diameter of approximately 6 million light years. If we compare it with the Milky Way, then it is 60 times larger and 2000 times heavier. Had IC1101 been in the location of the Milky Way, it would have swallowed up the large and the small Magellanic clouds, the Andromeda Nebula and the Triangulum Galaxy. Before you is UGC 9555, a huge galaxy that occupies third place. This galaxy is located directly in the galaxy triplet system named UGC 9555. The cluster is located in the direction of the constellation Camelopardalis, a distance of 820 million light years from the Earth. This enormous star studded island is just over 8 million light years in diameter. At the moment, the mass of this radio galaxy is quite difficult to estimate. But experts believe that it is no less than 65 to 75 trillion times the mass of the Sun. Like most huge galaxies, UGC 9555 attained such a size and acquired such a considerable mass due to the fact that it relentlessly consumed neighboring galaxies that dwelled close to the inhabitants of the cluster. Behold, almost the leader but still in second place in our intergalactic battle today, 3C236, and it's 15 million light years away. It is a radio galaxy of the Fanarov and Riley second class. It ranks among the largest of the known radio galaxies and is located in the direction of the constellation Leo Minor. The galaxy features a double double radio morphology, consisting of a giant relic source and an inner, more compact radio source. A recent episode of star formation closer to the core can be associated with the event that led to the reignition of radioactivity. And here finally, we have reached the leader for the moment, the galaxy Alcyoneus. In a new study, it became clear that its length is already equal to more than 16 million light years and it is located at a distance of 3 billion light years from the Earth. Researchers encountered the cosmic supergiant with the help of the so-called radio lobes, which are inherent to all massive galaxies, with the inclusion of our Milky Way. 
the existence of similar lobes on the Alcyoneus galaxy was able to be detected using the low-frequency airy inferometric network consisting of 20,000 radio antennas mounted on 52 platforms in various European countries. The discovered galaxy turned out to be a genuine supergiant, the likes of which has never been detected in the entire history of space observation. There is a supermassive black hole in the center of Alcyoneus, which slows down the formation of new stars and thus greatly affects the life cycle of the galaxy as a whole. Sometimes this causes a violent spectacle. The black hole, absorbing material from the giant disk around it, can form two jets that eject fuel for new stars from the galaxy at a speed of close to the speed of light. These plumes or jets travel huge distances and then turn into giant radio-emitting lobes. During this process, the stellar dust is heated to such a degree that it dissolves into plasma and begins to radiate in the radio frequency range. The galaxy is also impresses with its other characteristics, which researchers have been able to measure thanks to the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. For example, the supermassive black hole at the center of Alcyoneus is 400 million times more massive than our Sun, and the mass of the entire galaxy is estimated to be 240 billion times the mass of our Sun. As you can see, the majority of radio galaxies have gigantic dimensions, but why all of them aren't huge remains a mystery. It's believed that these giants are the oldest radio galaxies that have existed long enough, perhaps several hundred million years, for their radio jets to grow to an enormous size. If this is true, then there must be many more giant radio galaxies that are known today. And the discovery of similar giants and their study helps determine the evolution of galaxies in the first place. After all, we are talking about a powerful galactic structure that originated from what was at a one time a completely commonplace galaxy. The name Earth exists in most languages, associating our planet with the terra firma, which is how we usually think of it, whereas the real and true name of our planet, you can rest assured, might easily be ocean. After all, liquid water in the form of hydrosphere covers about 71% of the Earth's surface, or about 361 million square kilometers, leaving only 29% of the planet's area for dry land. There are places in space from which that's exactly how our planet looks, like it's nothing but ocean, the pearl in our solar system. When we try to look beyond its bounds, we find that we are surrounded by countless rocky and lifeless planets, in actual fact, dead worlds. And finding an ocean planet is an incredible rarity. Yet ocean planets exist in other distant systems, and every so often, very rarely, we find them. But never before, three ocean planets in one system. Even the system in which you and I are located can't afford this luxury. Welcome to an extraordinary environment, L9859, in the center of which is located a bright dwarf star of the M3V type situated 34.6 light years away in the southern Valens constellation. Also known as TOI 175, the star is equal to about one-third of the Sun's mass. It is indeed a dwarf, but apparently without active flares. Consequently, that has a favorable effect upon the planets, of which there are as many as five in the system. The planets L9859 b, c, d, E and F. Two of them are rocky planets such as Earth and Venus, which are close enough to the star to actually have a chance for primitive life. But the other three planets may contain water below the surface or in the atmosphere. Two of them contain a small amount of water, while up to 30% of the third planet's mass can be little more than water, which makes it an ocean world. What is known about these worlds? What are the chances 
that they have life. This is what we will talk about, but first things first, in order. Observations were carried out using the telescopes of the VLT facility, the TESS telescope and the HARPS spectrograph. The radii of those closest to the star, the exoplanets L9859b and C, according to TESS, range from 0.8 to 1.6 that of the Earth. These are very intriguing numbers, since a planet the size of ours is unlikely to be composed of ice or gas. Most likely, it will be similar in chemical composition to the Earth and Earth-like worlds, which for obvious reasons are of greater interest to mankind than any others. Having estimated the mass of the worlds of the L9859 system with the knowledge of their size, astronomers calculated their density. Planet L9859b is like Venus, but L9859c is almost like the Earth. It is believed that both of the exoplanets are Earth-like worlds, with small 12-14% to of their mass iron cores. For comparison, the mass of the Earth's core is approximately 30%. Indeed, these two planets are interesting, but they are rocky and extremely hot for a comfortable existence. Quite another matter is L9859d, the third planet in terms of distance, which is located in the middle of the system and is in the habitable zone. This world could aptly be called not the planet Earth, but the planet water. Judging by its density, water makes up to 36% of the mass of the celestial body. This is an extraordinarily good result. During a migration, due to powerful turbulent disturbances, this sort of an icy planet, with a mass of six to eight times that of the Earth, can find itself sufficiently near enough to its star for the outer ice crust of the planet to melt and the planet to end up being completely covered by an ocean of liquid water as much as 133 kilometers deep. The pressure on the floor of an ocean like that would be on the order of approximately 20,000 atm, which is sufficient for the formation of polymorphic modifications of ice, which are heavier than liquid water and under this kind of pressure will never melt. Of course, for the emergence of biological life similar to that of the Earth, it is essential that the planet be in the habitable zone. This would permit the ice layer on the surface to melt. In addition to that, crucial minerals exist in the planetary crust. Between the layer of liquid water and the crust, this type of planet has a thick layer of solid ice, blocking access to the minerals. The latter, however, can be brought in by meteorites and comets. Who knows, maybe this planet is already teeming with marine life. Yes, of course, they will look different, since the red dwarf star has its own influence on its surrounding world. And by far, not every creature can adapt. But the truth is that we know very little about it at all. In any case, this world is extraordinarily enchanting. And what can be said about the two outermost planets, E and F? Although the data suggests, at very least, a water-rich atmosphere on their surfaces, nonetheless, these Venus-sized planets may be covered in ice and a thick atmosphere. This is also a good indicator. More time is needed to investigate these objects. But we also have good news. The largest infrared space telescope, the James Webb, is due to be launched as soon as in October 2021. And by the way, star L9859 will make its way into that zone of the sky, which Webb will be observing 200 days a year. And it is planned that in 2027, the ground-based optical telescope ELT will be commissioned, which will be two and a half times larger than the current record holder, the VLT. By means of these instruments, it will be possible to thoroughly research the planets of the L9859 system. The high albedo of the satellite indicates that the surface of the ice is pretty clean and young. It is believed that the cleaner the ice on the surface of the icy satellites, the younger it is. Let's also pay attention to the plains. Smooth plains can be formed by the activity of cryovolcanoes, which erupt to the surface filling areas with spreading and hardening water. 
From Europa's orbit, we can see a chaotic relief that has different geometric shapes. We can also observe areas which are dominated by lines and stripes, ridges, usually doubled, as well as impact craters. Their number is small. There are only 40 named craters over 5 kilometers in diameter, which suggests that the surface is relatively young, from 20 to 180 million years old. So Europe has high geological activity. The spectral analysis of the dark lines and spots of the structure shows presence of salts, magnesium sulfate in particular. The reddish hue allows to assume the presence of iron and sulfur compounds as well. Apparently, they are contained in the ocean of Europa and are ejected to the surface through clefts and then freeze. In addition, traces of hydrogen peroxide and strong acids were found. For instance, there is a high chance that Europa contains sulfuric acid hydrate. Let's land on that interesting object. As it turns out, it's not that easy. The thing is, Jupiter's moon Europa is surrounded by a region of sharp ice needles which stretches along the entire equator and is extremely dangerous for space probes to land on. Ice needles, also known as calgospores and Europa, can reach up to 15 meters in height. Large as they are, these structures still cannot be seen on the images of Europe available to us so far. A few careful maneuvers and we landed. Phew! We managed not to damage our spacecraft by this gigantic icicle. The incredible view of Europe opens to our eyes. Its surface is very cold compared to the Earth. The temperature here is 150-190 degrees Celsius below zero. But that is not the main thing to worry about here. The radiation level on Europe is extremely high, as the satellite's orbit passes through the powerful radiation belt of Jupiter. The daily dose of radiation here is nearly a million times bigger than on Earth. This dose is enough to cause severe radiation sickness. But no worries, we have a proper radiation protection. At least, we hope so. Well, with this in mind, we are sending a tunnel robot with a nuclear reactor into the deep of Europe that could drill ice while collecting ice and water samples and sending information to the surface via fiber optic cable. Surprisingly, Europe has several layers of ocean, separated by different types of ice, formed at different depths and under different pressures. It is likely that in each of these layers, different life forms might be found. Species that have adapted to the particular conditions of the ocean stratum may exist. However, if these life forms turn out to be unlike anything we have seen on Earth, it might be difficult for us to recognize them. And besides, we might not find life there at all. But these thoughts wouldn't stop our curiosity, would they? One of the places in the solar system that is worthy of notice and examination is located at an average distance of 250 million kilometers from us and stretches out for more than one astronomical unit. That is to say, the distance of the Earth from the Sun. This region is located between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. As you may have already guessed, we are talking about the asteroid belt a place where there is an accumulation of a variety of small celestial bodies of every possible size and shape. On May 3, 2011, a probe took the first photograph of Vesta from a distance of just over 1 million kilometers, after which an active phase of studying this asteroid began. By June 27, the craft had slowed down, approaching closer to Vesta all the time. And after another month, having already made almost two revolutions around the Sun, the craft reached Vesta and switched to an orbit around it at an altitude of 16,000 kilometers. All of July, the craft was engaged in photographing of the surface of Vesta. The probe confirmed just how large the Rhea Silvia crater in Vesta's southern hemisphere is, about 500 kilometers in diameter and 19 kilometers deep. 
The spacecraft also revealed that the mountain in the center of the huge crater, which the Hubble telescope had once captured, is more than two times the height of Mount Everest and is the second tallest mountain in the solar system, taking a back seat to the Martian Olympus. Upon closer inspection, the probe found a second large impact basin, now called Veninia, that is partially covered by the younger Rhea Silvia basin. These two impacts changed the surface of Vesta and probably almost destroyed it. It remains a mystery how Vesta was able to survive such an extraordinary cataclysm. It is probable that numerous Class V asteroids, debris from the impact, were scattered in all directions. Giant impacts have created dozens of gorges encircling Vesta's equator that were revealed in the probe's images. Some of these canyons rival the Grand Canyon in size, reaching 465 kilometers in length and 4 kilometers in depth. The probe's data also reveals that the massive impact formed Rio Silvia a mere billion years ago. Thus, the surface of the southern hemisphere looks younger than the northern, where a tremendous number of craters have been preserved. Previously, researchers thought Vesta was a substantially dry object, but the Dawn space probe detected water-rich minerals on Vesta's surface that are associated with carbon-rich material. These materials were presumably taken to Vesta by asteroids or comets from the outer solar system that is richer in volatile substances. On September 5, 2012, having completed an extended mission, the craft broke free of Vesta's orbit and headed toward the next object of research, Ceres, a transition which took two and a half years. On March 6, 2015, having traversed a total of 4.9 billion kilometers at a distance of 60,600 kilometers from it, the craft was captured in the dwarf planet's gravitational field. And in early June, at a distance of 4,400 kilometers from the surface, the first photographs were already obtained. While the Vesta observations broadly supported the existing hypothesis and provided more details to fill in the gaps, less was known about Ceres. In fact, most of what we now know about the dwarf planet was provided by the Dawn spacecraft. Initial calculations suggested that Ceres might be separated into layers, although the composition of these layers was unknown before the probe. Given a low average density, Ceres was expected to have a large amount of water ice under its surface. However, the probe's measurements have confirmed that Ceres is actually composed of a rocky core and a crust of water ice covered by a dusty outer layer. Dawn also uncovered evidence of the presence of clothrate hydrates, a gas trapped in the crystalline structure of the water molecules that makes the amazing strength and low crust density of Ceres possible. While a large portion of Ceres is relatively smooth due to its semi-liquid subsurface layer of ice, the spacecraft found a large mountain that it wasn't able to see previously. This mountain is about 4 kilometers high and is called Ahuna Mons. Its well-defined domed shape, similar to volcanoes on Earth, suggests that it was likely formed due to cryovolcanic activity. Although cryovolcanism may exist in other icy worlds, Dawn's observations make Mount Ahuna the closest known cryovolcano in the solar system. Other observations by the Herschel Space Observatory have shown small amounts of water vapor around several portions of Ceres, which suggests that it may have a weak atmosphere or even ongoing cryovolcanic activity. The probe revealed that this gas could be due to solar particles colliding with the water ice on Ceres, which is then released as vapor, resulting in a temporary weak atmosphere. Spectroscopic data from Dawn also confirmed the presence of ammonia on the surface of the dwarf planet. Conditions in the main asteroid belt are too warm for ammonia to form, which requires much colder conditions and which raises questions about its origins. Ceres could have formed much further away in the colder outer portion of the solar system before migrating to its current position or ammonia could have been brought to Ceres by celestial bodies from the outer solar system. The spacecraft also confirmed the presence of carbonates on Ceres, 
which had been detected 10 years earlier using telescopic data. A great quantity of them once again confirmed the existence of an ocean early in Sirius' history. This dwarf planet may even be warm enough to have a small amount of liquid water remaining below the surface. It's astonishing that for two centuries the dwarf planets Ceres and Vesta appear to be no more than dim points of light among the stars, until the Dawn mission 